lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. But it's written in the scriptures and it's not some idle claim. I didn't know I had permission to murder and to maim. You want it darker? We kill the flame. Greetings, Slashaholics, and welcome to another episode of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am joined by the 80s Slasher Librarian, Joshua Rue. You doing all right over there? Doing good. How's it going, Sean? Good. All right, and we got David Bergantino back with us for another exciting Freddy Krueger Tales of Terror book. And despite it being a pink book, it is not romance, despite what a lot of people on their Google reviews tended to rant about. So, but now, depends on how you look at the book. Yeah, I, I decided to reinforce it by uh, having uh, by dressing and uh, dressing like I was somebody looking for a job and uh, have a job board posted behind me. Oh yeah, help, help wanted. I love that. Con- yeah, hell yeah. I thought, I, you were trying to ask sell- this. I thought you were trying to sell me something, so I immediately was gonna like tune it out because like I don't need a timeshare or anything. That's what it yeah. kind of looks like on the board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was, I was, I was trying to search for, um, for like college job boards kinds of thing for the theme, and this is the, this is the closest one the uh, gate I got. Looks good. Uh, gonna ask what kind of opportunities is being offered back there. Well. You know, Fre- Freddie's the hiring manager, so... <laughs> well, hey, if you take his timeshare, uh, Sean, you get a free set of hand claws, so... Ah, all right. Oh. <laughs> all right. But, there's, uh, there's, there's book number seven right there, Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Time Timeshare of Terror. Timeshare of Terror, I like that. I like that a lot. There we go. Well, Let's see, we... We've been through a couple of these books, and I just I waited to read. Help, I, I waited to listen to Help Wanted until we we're actually doing this interview, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take what I've learned, and I'm gonna deduce who the killer is based on what I've talked about. And sure enough, when we started reading the book, I'm like, who's disappearing off by themselves? Who doesn't have a lot of dialogue? I thought it was Doug. I was like. Doug barely has any dialogue. It's going to be Doug. I was like, Doug, Doug, Doug. Whether or not it is Doug is up for, you know, the spoilers at the end of this episode. But Didn't I figure this one out pretty quickly? Like, wither it down and uh, say... I, can't I think this this one you didn't get quite as quickly as... Okay. Uh, twice twice Burden was the... You pretty much guessed it up front. <laughs> That's right. The library. Back yeah. to it. And this one... You you still guessed it, but you meandered a little bit in the middle. Well, yeah, because you did a good job of uh, making it uh, hard to to, to deduce. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, the the reveal was pretty damn cool. Which we're gonna get to that. Um, I'm I'm glad because this was probably the hardest of the four books to write. Really? Yeah, because by by this time I was burnt out on writing this series. And it was a drudge. And in fact, there's another draft where I wrote a scene that so horrified my editor that she called me. So she's like, you can't write this. This is a young adult book. You can't do this. <laughs> okay, what's and the scene? <laughs> really dark. It was really dark. And so I, I basically scrapped what I had written and started from scratch again. So the scene that takes place in the restaurant was you toning it down? <laughs> yeah this, so, the, uh, we, we gotta know we gotta know what was so dark what was so dark basically I had someone killed and then their body was stuffed under someone's bed and then I had a sex scene take place on the bed above the corpse uh yeah that <laughs> it would have been a romance then I mean yes, at least that person wouldn't have left that uh, review it would have earned its pink, so to say. <laughs> wonder what a green book would be considered. Anyways, um, <laughs> same thing we were just talking about, apparently. Uh, so this one was, uh, you might have been burnt out, man, but this was a really solid book. Um, the characters were fun. Uh, had a lot of fun with Chester. I think um, every person in this book needed to smoke a joint and calm down (laughs) everyone was so amped up it was like it was like everybody in town was like no sex no drugs no music no nothing and everyone is just like just full of 
anger. Everybody was just so cranked up in this. Well, it didn't Jason surprise me that people skips started getting town. killed. Jason so, hears all that and skips town. He's like, eh, I'll let Freddy handle it. So there's no so sex, you, no drugs. <laughs> so you guys can tell sort of my mind state while I was writing it. I'm just like, ah, I gotta write this damn book. Ah. <laughs> well, then okay, Deadly well, Disguise, man. That one was just, that was even better than this one. And that well, one came after. That, that, one, that one I had found my second wind. Oh, and okay. I decided to make a re- write. Frankly, I my decision was to very quickly write a really ridiculous action movie version of Freddy Krueger. Yeah. And somehow it just came together. But okay. this was this this particular book was a chore. You yeah. uh, so in the middle of writing it. Sorry, Sean. In the middle of writing it, did you uh, go to like a fast food restaurant and get treated really poorly and like, uh, you know, visualize stuff in their head in the fryer? Or I was doing that a lot everywhere back then. <laughs> just everywhere you go, visualize. How can yeah. I kill these people? Um all right, Sean, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I just felt like Freddy Krueger was like, I feel like at a certain point in this book, he was like, one, almost wanted to step back and just let everyone kill each other just based on how amped up they are. Uh, <laughs> it was, okay, like, let's look at this character. We got, we got Laura who's trying to find a job and she's looking everywhere and she has like certain people that are, you know, have they have beef with her so they're not helping her get jobs and she lost her job because of her ex-boyfriend who's a steroided up, piece of shit named Chester that cleans a pool. And then you got Doug, who's like the super sensitive best friend, but his girlfriend hates him and treats him like garbage. And then (laughs) she meets this guy named Buck. He's a nice hospital orderly, but is he? He seems like the kind of guy that keeps a shrine in his closet, you know? like all these He needs a cold shower badly. Buck needs a cold shower. (laughs) All all of them do, just... (laughs) <laughs> it, it has it probably hasn't rained in a while just everyone just needs to get hosed down it's yeah true. and then you got uh you know laura's little sister um shelby wow man talk about dysfunctional family yeah uh, well she seems cool and then she gets sick and i'm like where are you going is she actually <laughs> sick? Does, does this Shelby even exist? Like, I need proof. I need evidence. Like, I'm keeping a log with me when I'm doing this in the when I'm listening to this in the field. <laughs> That's what I'm doing when I'm narrating it. You know, I'm just I'm I'm just looking out for those little nuances and stuff. Um, How sick but... is this Shelby? Let's see. <laughs> let's let's introduce a couple of the characters to the listeners. Uh, we're going to introduce you to Buck and Chester. That's Laura's boyfriend and the guy that wants to be Laura's boyfriend. Uh, and they're pretty amped up here, too. So, uh, at the party. Yep. Not fully in control of herself, Laura jabbed a finger right into his chest. You fired me, remember? Chester's eyes lit up with anger. I gave you a choice. Laura was almost speechless. Three weeks ago, she had been a lifeguard at the pool where Chester was the head lifeguard. Listen, Chester, you had no cause to be so jealous. Doug is a friend. I told you that. You need to get the muscle out of your ears so you can hear better. I gave you a choice, Chester said again, as if to prove how dense his brain was. Listen, I didn't decide on that budget cut. One lifeguard had to go. I let you decide. I thought it was pretty nice of me. Yeah, some choice, me or Doug. What was I supposed to say? It was completely unfair. I could get you fired for what you did. Why don't you try? Chester replied. Because I got better things to do than waste any more time on you, you moron! She was breathing heavily with anger and a little fear. Chester had reared up to full height. You had no right to accuse me of cheating on you. Doug and I were friends long before I met you. And we'll be friends long after your muscles squeeze the last of your tiny brains out of your head. So stay away from me, or I will go to the bureau. Instantly, Chester's eyes narrowed into slits. A large hand came down and grabbed her shoulder. I don't like the way you're talking to me. You knew that? His grip was firm and painful. He leaned down and breathed alcohol and smoke into her face. To keep from gagging, she turned away. Let go of me! She whimpered, but Chester didn't move. Let her go, commanded a new voice. 
Chester and Laura both turned toward the silhouetted figure standing before the light of the candles. She recognized the voice. It was Buck. Oh, and who's gonna make me? Chester glowered, puffing up and making Buck look even more like a stick figure by comparison. Buck sighed with exaggerated boredom. Couldn't you come up with something more original than that? Look, if we're gonna fight, shouldn't we just get to it? Chester laughed. I'll crush you. Every other supervillain from the dawn of comic books has used that line. Buck yawned. Then his body tensed, and in a low, commanding voice, he said, Make your move, buddy, or take off. Either way, make it snappy. At first, Chester was too shocked to be angry. Then, blinking as if clearing his mind, he nodded. Right, sorry. I don't know what came over me. He started past Buck toward the house. Laura knew Chester was faking, but she didn't have time to warn Buck before Chester's powerful fist was streaking toward his face. With lightning reflexes, Buck sidestepped the blow and delivered one of his own to Chester's ribs with his elbow. The dodge, the rib pain, and his drunkenness threw Chester terribly off balance. Before he could recover, Buck stepped in and kicked Chester behind one knee. Chester's leg buckled, and he fell to the ground like he had been dropped from a roof. Buck stepped over him and reached a hand out to Laura. I guess we'd uh, better go, huh? Laura stared dumbly at Buck's hand, then down at Chester, who was clutching his knee to his chest and groaning. Others were coming out from the house to see what was happening. Buck took Laura's hand and pulled her gently forward. Come on, it's okay. In shock, Laura allowed herself to be led toward the house. The crowd parted for them. Then one girl cried out, He's getting up! Buck and Laura both turned just as a tremendous roar filled the air. Chester had catapulted himself at them, aiming for Buck. Pushing Laura out of the way, Buck met Chester, grabbing his outstretched arms. Rolling onto his back, Buck lifted his legs and pressed his feet against Chester's midsection. Continuing the roll, Buck pushed, launching Chester into the air. Chester landed on his back on the concrete patio. Buck, meanwhile, rolled deftly onto his feet, preparing for a counterattack. From the way Chester curled up into a ball on the patio, an attack was unlikely at best. Hey! Doug shouted from the back door. Jumping down the three steps, he kneeled beside Chester. You could have killed him, he shouted at Buck. He was going to kill me, Buck said, his breath coming in short gasps. And he was hurting Laura. Doug looked up at Laura, who nodded in support of Buck's story. But even this did nothing to quell Doug's anger. I don't care what happened. I don't like fighting at my house, under any circumstances. But, forget it, Doug interjected. You guys will have to leave. Buck started to protest again, but Laura came to his side and tugged his arm. He's right, Buck, let's just go. Now it was Buck who allowed himself to be led away. Shelby was waiting for them just inside the house. The three of them headed toward the door together. As Buck unlocked his car, Doug's front screen door banged open. Out darted Allison, obviously in a huff. Chester stumbled out right after her on a weaving path toward his car, an old Corvette Stingray. Doug came out then. He turned for a moment and called back to Rain. Come on, we have to get him home. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Rain came out and stood on the top step, her arms crossed defiantly. Rain! Allison called sharply. You have to come sit in the back with me. Chester was now leaning against the stingray, whistling to himself as if he didn't have a care in the world. I sure don't want to sit with Chester. Rain stamped once in frustration, then started down the steps. Doug headed toward the car, keys jangling in his hand. Come on, Laura, Shelby said, urging her sister to get into Buck's car. Laura slid into the front passenger seat. Shelby had already taken her place in the back. Buck pulled away from the curb as the engine in Chester's stingray turned over. As they passed by, Doug gave Laura a wry smile. Chester was slumped against his window, already fast asleep. Rain glared from the back seat with Allison. Laura looked back once they reached the end of the block. The Corvette's headlights angled out into the street behind them. 
Chester lived in the same general direction as Laura, so Doug would be following them for several blocks. While they rode down a long block near Elm Street, headlights appeared in the distance heading their way. They were swerving from side to side, the driver apparently out of control. "'What's that?' asked Shelby, who was leaning forward from the back seat. "'Oh, shit!' was Buck's only reply, because the lights were now heading straight toward them. "'Hold on!' Cutting the wheel sharply to the right, Buck jumped the curb with a violent lurch. The girl screamed. There was a thump and Shelby cried out in pain. Buck grunted as his chest hit the steering wheel. The car came to a rolling stop on someone's lawn. Laura, secured by her shoulder belt, was unhurt. As she turned to check on Shelby, she caught a glimpse of the other car, a Cadillac, as it careened by. In the caddy was an old man, clutching his chest with one hand. The other hand was clawing at the steering wheel. Laura followed the caddy's taillights as the car headed toward another set of headlights. Oh, oh God, Doug! Laura screamed. The Cadillac veered directly into the path of the stingray. There was no escaping a collision this time. With a muffled crunch, the Cadillac broadsided the Corvette on the driver's side. Both cars seemed to jump into the air. Glass exploded. The next moments were silent, but for the buzz of streetlights. Buck groaned and rubbed his chest. Shelby moaned in the back seat. From the wreckage down the street, she heard no sound at all. Yeah, what a couple characters. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but in my head, Chester came from Philadelphia, apparently. Or <laughs> my interpretation of Philadelphia. I love that interpretation. I'm like, oh, hadn't thought of that, but I like it. You know, I know, I know this is a bit off topic, but when I, when I saw Chester in this book, okay. <laughs> you know how they make a bunch of, like, shark movies and they, they do shark spinoffs? They did this. It was a fake trailer on YouTube for shark pool and it was like a, a person got killed in the pool and it was like oh my god someone got killed in the pool what are we gonna do and this guy's like don't go in the pool and everyone's like but it's hot and then there's this buff guy going <laughs> hey i heard you tell people they can't go in the pool well it's my party they're gonna go in the pool and he was like there's a shark in there don't get in the pool and then people keep dying and they're like how could this been prevented don't get in the pool there is a shark in there but this buff guy was seriously chester Oh, is that is that how you pictured him? Absolutely. Awesome. Just, awesome. Tell you people not to go in my pool. <laughs> and since he was a lifeguard, I thought that was extra funny. Oh my god! Uh, the the best shark ever was the Ghost Shark movie. Um, oh, I, I absolutely agree. That was fun. Oh, I haven't yeah. seen Ghost Shark yet, and I've seen Damn, Ghost Sharks. Nine hundred <laughs> billion billion shark movies. It tr it trumps the other ones because this one is like. If there is water present, it can slip inhabit and slide. the water of that. So like oh, you said, it goes down a slip and slide, it comes out the other end and eats the kid. Guy gets water at a drinking fountain, shark, you know, just, it, it's really uh -huh. inventive. It all started, it, it, it wasn't supposed to be a sci-fi movie. Like, there was this trailer that came out, like, years before for Ghost Shark 2, and it was just a, it had this guy that was hunting the ghost shark. He's like, gonna get this goddamn ghost shark. Uh, they even got the star George Hardy from Troll 2 uh, to, like, be in the trailer. He's hunting a ghost shark? Huh? He's hunting yeah. a ghost shark? Like, hunting, he get... it, 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 it's all parody. It's all fun. Oh. But apparently someone liked the idea, and then sci-fi ended up having a ghost shark movie. Uh, you got to check it out, man, if you like if you like the, the shitty shark movies. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to name the next one, shitty shark movie. Um, I actually came up with a shark movie last week that hasn't been done yet but it's specifically so i can get sharks places that they shouldn't be where, okay that? well we've already done sand shark ghost shark mm -hmm. uh swamp swamp shark mm -hmm. um okay where, where are you going? oh i have snow shark i think there's one in the ice 
Mine, mine doesn't depend on water. Okay. Uh, you'll see. To... You'll see. I'm work. I'm working on it now. I'm. I'm okay. I, okay. I, I, it's 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 something where I was doing something else, and <clears throat> it's an, another story that I came up with years ago, and I was I I reapproached it again, and then I don't know. I'm walking on the street and I went, wait a minute. If I turn this one thing into a shark, that's just so much better than what I was writing before. <laughs> so now I'm redoing the whole thing. Okay. Um, okay, I, I got it. A shark that's not in water. Lone shark shark. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. That would make a good trailer. Lone this shark, shark will collect his debt. Uh-huh. Will collect your debt. Uh you know, back when the last Sharknado movie came out, it was right around the time that Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom came out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they got the perfect title here if they would just make this last Sharknado be like back in time, make it prehistoric somehow, call it Jurassic or call it Sharknado 6, whatever, Jurassic Swirled Fallen Franchise, you know? <laughs> there actually is a Jurassic Shark, though. Mm -hmm. No, I know there's a Jurassic Shark, but I was thinking... Sharknado 6, Jurassic Swirled instead of World, Fallen yeah. Franchise instead of Fallen Kingdom. Because right. they always make fun of their, they make fun of themselves in the titles anyways. I thought that would have been perfect. Yeah. Uh, but we're talking about the book. That's after the Slash stuff. What book? Yeah. yeah. What oh, book are we talking okay. about? The Pink Romance book? The Pink Romance book. Right. Okay. People yeah, start so, dying. Mm -hmm. Let's, you ahead. know, when people die, there's cryptic messages left at the scene that say help wanted and you're 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 starting to wonder is freddie possessing the main character who actually wants a job or is somebody using freddie stuff to clear jobs because a lot of the jobs she wants there's now an opening because somebody died so you're starting i i the part of me wondered if it was the main character but i'm or buck I, I thought it was the main character but even when the job opening's open she still didn't go for it so i'm like okay <laughs> I, I don't think it's her but it might be crazy stalker guy buck Let's see. Uh, am I getting am I getting these mixed up? Like the job at the mall and stuff. No, that happened in this. Um, because that was the first kill, and I thought that was a pretty wicked kill. Um, I know we we agreed on three clips, but I would, since that's the first one, yeah, I think we should play the mall clip because that that one is a pretty brutal kill, and it's what kicks off the whole chain of events that follow. So uh, I'm yeah. keeping a list. <laughs> he's keeping he's always got a list he's checking it twice okay roll it roll it the springwood mall was always closed by 10 o'clock but on some nights movement could be detected inside fair warning well after the closing these were the evenings that allison heath was the closing manager as a key employee it was her responsibility to lock the store up at the end of the business day allison considered this a privilege particularly on the day of a big shipment. Often, she would stay for hours, winding down from her day, indulging in her favorite hobby, trying on new clothes. Happily, a particularly large shipment of fabulous fall fashions had just arrived. Allison had a lot of winding down to do. The stress of supervising the receipt and display of new clothing was almost more than Allison could take. Slipping into a sleek black skirt, she sighed heavily, trying to excel her day. The last few had been hell. She had endured the party, the accidents, and finally, her fight with that loser, Chester. To hell with him, Allison thought mildly, getting a significant thrill from the faux diamond bracelet she clipped to her wrist. Chester was officially cut loose. Buck Lochner, however, was another story. The thought of him made her pulse quicken. He had actually stopped by the store, if only she had been there. When Beth had told her that Buck and Laura had stopped by, she didn't know how to take it at first. Of course, Buck's suspicions were right on target. Laura would have been hired in an instant, had anyone at Fair Warnings Management ever seen her resume. But Allison had buried it first, in the trash can. She had been the last to see it, unless someone on the janitorial staff had caught a glimpse of it late at night. A smile crept over Allison's lips. She looked at the black velvet cocktail shoes she had slipped on her feet. They were ultra slim and sleek, with low heels. They looked as good as they felt. Laura's resume, somehow, 
Buck had figured it out and had threatened to go to the managers. It all seemed like a joke at first, but as the day wore on, the humor of the situation wore off. Soon, she was left with the growing fear that Buck would actually carry out his threat. She kept telling herself that he had no proof, but even that didn't dispel her fears. Allison had practically forced Beth down the manager's throats, and Beth wasn't turning out to be a very good employee. She wasn't well-liked by the other staff at all. So Allison's fears took firm root and grew strong. Then Buck appeared at the front of the store about ten minutes before closing. He stopped, looked in directly at her, and glared. His look clearly suggested that he intended to do more than just complain to the managers about her. Allison was frightened, but just as she turned to pick up the phone to call security, his expression changed. He smiled, then just walked away. Allison shooed out the rest of the employees and closed the store quickly. Finally alone, she wondered if she could still call security after all. Had Buck gone, or could he be waiting for her out by her car? Just then, a stray piece of packing popcorn on the register counter reminded her of the new shipment of clothing. This brought a certain clarity and focus to her mind. She certainly wasn't going to let Buck spoil her ritual. If he was out there, he'd have a long wait. Damn the torpedoes! Allison Heath had clothes to try on. For the two hours that followed, Allison pretended to be every type of runway model, wearing every combination of outfit available to her. She saved the best, the sleek black dress, for last. It was simple and sexy, perfect for a night of clubbing. Unfortunately, she wasn't old enough to get into bars yet, but she'd been to a funeral or two, and this skirt might just be perfect for that, too. Allison stepped out of the dressing room and in front of the three-way mirror. Then she gasped. Her hand flew to her mouth in shock. She looked ten times sexier than she had expected. Twirling the skirt, she tossed her head at the same time, pretending she was in slow motion like in a shampoo commercial on TV. No doubt about it, she thought, in this dress, she could ruin a funeral by bringing the dead guy back to life. Her exultation was cut short by a movement. Behind her, a shape rose up. The mirror showed six people, three reflections of Allison and three of her visitor. Twelve eyes, but six of them burned with utter hatred. Spinning around, Allison tried to stifle her fear. Hey, what are you doing here? Allison wanted to say more, but lost her voice when caught in the cold gaze of the visitor. She stood paralyzed and for a moment resembled one of the impossibly slim but fashionably dressed mannequins in her store. The next moment found her moving again, clawing at the belt that the visitor had looped deftly around her throat. The belt was biting into Allison's neck, cutting off her air. It didn't even occur to Allison to hit or claw her attacker. She just kept trying to loosen the belt around her throat, digging into her own skin with French manicured nails. Suddenly, Allison was jerked upward as her attacker lifted her with impossible strength. Since the belt was used as a handle, the sudden motion nearly broke her neck. That would have been merciful. Instead, it merely constricted her throat more, crushing her larynx with great pain, but not killing her. The attacker wrapped the end of the belt securely around the light fixture hanging from the ceiling, then stepped back. Allison's body went limp as she awaited death, spinning slowly in midair. She thought of her parents, of how she had been such a bitch to so many people. She thought of school and of hotels and chicken wings. Her oxygen-starved brain was shutting down. Her vision was dimming. During one revolution, she caught sight of herself in a mirror, and her last thought was of how hot she looked in black velvet. So that's one job opening now. 
And she's like, I'll, I'll feel bad if I do it. And I'm like, you have been complaining about a job this entire time. Like, you know, there is an opening. Well, remember, half of my characters are martyrs. Or they act that yeah. way. So there, there you go. Well, everybody wishes that they could be, you know, for people, or they act like they could be in certain situations. But, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, only a few people probably have the guts to follow through. But in this town, everybody's ready to die for everybody. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, of course they would. There's no sex, no drugs, no alcohol. Everybody's amped up. Uh, and they're having to write a damn book. And, you know, it's just, uh, that's kind of bleeding into it, isn't it? <laughs> the fury, the rage. Yes. Uh, from the outside. Um, from this point straight, forward, I want to notify everyone there will be spoilers from this point on. It's really hard to talk about the rest of this book without spoilers. So any of these you books, have been warned. I mean, yeah, it's hard to talk about any of this book, any of these books, if you haven't listened or read them yet, and because uh, they are whodunits, you know that's what the whole that's the whole thing of them. Uh, definitely stop listening, read, listen. However, if you can get a copy of the book or listen to the audio book, uh, definitely check that out because we're going to be giving it away uh, pretty soon. So, yeah, that, that sets the events rolling, Sean. Uh, yeah, and what was really cool is that there are actually Easter eggs in this book that lead to Deadly Disguise. It was the, um, the, it was the Applebee Mansion. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really cool seeing that. Um, because I mean, I think it burned down later, so I'm, I'm guessing it's you know before this happened, <laughs> or unless they rebuilt it for like the third time. Uh, but yeah, it was really cool seeing that. <clears throat> Doug was working on it, and he had a you know he had a thing for Laura, um, just like Buck did, and just like Chester did. <laughs> Laura's a popular girl, um, but unfortunately, but Doug has a girlfriend who he absolutely hates, but he feels bad about dumping, but she is really protective of him so you're starting to wonder if she gets dumped is she going to start doing some crazy vindictive stuff because things start happening and at a certain point i didn't even think freddie was involved until the end i thought these people were just fucking up each other's lives but that's Which that's what it made it even more far fun. off it made it even more fun you know because they were everybody was out to get each other and uh you know we had a cool scene at the appleby mansion uh, where it turns out that Buck was trying to sabotage, you know, he was out there listening, listening to the whole thing, set up that whole th uh, drawing and stuff in the street outside of Laura's house. He caused a lot of mayhem. Uh, he sure did. And, uh, oh, what? This is 2000. Oh, I know who he's based on. Who? My stalker, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> they draw something out in front of your house <laughs> no it was actually much worse well much worse than that <laughs> but um yeah yeah that's right i think now that uh, now i now that i think about it i think that's one of the reasons why i had gone dark and why during this period is because i was being stalked uh this time was probably the most serious other times weren't but but and so it you know kind of puts you in a dark place when you're uh, afraid yeah, yeah. all the time <laughs> i've had a i've had a i've had one instance of that in my life uh, with an ex uh after breaking up found out she was like just i got to look in my rearview mirror sometimes she'd be like following me it's, it's creepy but that's um, that's the stand thing. outside of my house just standing there it freaked me out so. yeah yeah but that's the thing about and that's why bucks the way he is is sometimes those people are people you think are just fine and you spend a lot of time but then something happens and they become an entirely different person yeah well, that was the thing with buck he he would mm -hmm. he would get really angry and then he would defend himself saying like oh all bad stuff happened to me and then he, he would get he would nice again and it would just be that back and forth back and forth to the point where you could just tell he was just really unstable yeah that's why i suspected him for a long time especially you after know. like two dates and he's like i love you i would do anything for you i would kill for you you got problems i can make him disappear and she's like um that might no. have been when i stopped suspecting him actually <laughs> you know what, you know what it's too obvious okay okay too obvious he's off the suspect list all right let's look at the rest of them what do they got to hide mm-hmm well, uh, we can go into the next kill and then talk about it a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, not may maybe it wasn't the next kill, but let's go. Uh, I'm feeling like some fast food. What about you guys? I'm, I'm a little yeah. hungry. 
Okay. So, uh, <laughs> it seems that Doug's girlfriend, who none of the three of us can remember her name, yeah. <laughs> so she will go Doug's girlfriend for the time being, uh, you find out that she's actually been sabotaging a lot of the stuff in Laura's life, and you're like, okay, well, I guess she's not possessed, because she's a piece of shit on her own, she doesn't need Freddy's help. <laughs> um, well, somebody is not satisfied with their order, at the restaurant so no pickles and they got pickles what? maybe we should uh roll a clip and let them see how dissatisfied they were with their order roll it or nuts in love whatever the case rain admired buck's industriousness sure she had slipped the roach in the burger and left a few hang-ups on laura's answering machine for effect but buck was doing the real work if doug weren't around buck would make a good pet boyfriend I'll just continue to use him until I get what I want, Rain thought. Then he's bye-bye. Hopefully he'll get what he wants at the same time and all will be well. If not, that would be his problem. Rain hoped he never found out how she really felt. The back door of the big game burger opened and shut with a greasy squeak. Rain barely looked up. Billy had returned for his watch. Nearly finished closing up the restaurant, Rain went to the fryer to perform her nightly ritual. She took a single frozen french fry and dropped it in the grease that had been deep frying food all day. The oil was still hot and bubbled the moment the fry dropped into it. To Rain, it looked like a million tiny piranhas devouring the fry. Mesmerized, she stared into the boiling little pool until the fry turned from white to light brown to dark brown and finally became a black and crispy thing. Rain smiled. Just then, a hand grabbed her shoulder tightly and spun her around. Rain shrieked. Jeez, you scared me! She whined at the intruder. What do you want? She got no answer. The hand still grabbed her shoulder tightly. She tried to shrug off the hand, which was now beginning to hurt. Ow! What's your problem? The word you was the answer Rain received, and it was the last word she ever heard. In a blur of speed, the intruder spun Rain back around. She was facing the deep fryer now. The intruder's other hand shot up and pushed against the back of her head. Rain's face was being forced down toward the hot grease. She struggled against the force that was pushing her closer and closer to the smelly, boiling oil. Her hands flailed helplessly. She was unable to scream. Even a foot away, her face began to burn. The tip of her nose touched the oil and began to sizzle immediately. The pain was intense and concentrated on a small area. Now, suddenly she was able to scream, but it was too late. Rain's entire head was suddenly plunged into the boiling grease. Her last sensation was of being stung in the face by a million billion wasps. The hen held Rain in the grease until her struggling ceased. When she was let go, Rain's body slumped backwards and onto the floor. Her face had become a blackened, crispy thing. me of uh what was it the watchman movie where he has the the deep fryer grease and he throws it to the guy's face and he's like i'm not locked in here with you you're locked in here with me which is <laughs> funny because he eventually became freddy in another freddy thing so it's like we come kind of full circle with the the grease and the freddy but uh yeah he's, that was man i think we've all had grease burns before you know just like look like on the hand or something yeah, like, like one, one little drop and you're like oh that like that hurts but it just seems like, well, like it's everywhere gets you through the like sends a shock through your whole body you know just just your head getting stuffed in there just imagine that oh my god just wow i can't believe that's why this is one of those scenes that like i try to explain to people don't let the young adult thing throw you off 
on these books. Seriously. This is not goosebumps, you know. This is, this is even beyond Fear Street. Uh, this isn't your. This isn't like child, like children's book, Freddy or something. Some brutal shit. <laughs> That's pretty dark, actually. I'm, I'm just picturing a children's book, Freddy. Like, what's the worst thing you can do to someone? Like a slap or calling them a name or something. Just first of all, there there is, there is no razor fingers because they, that wouldn't be right. He'd have like plastic. It would ones. be sporks, plastic sporks. <laughs> Man, where have I seen that before? The spork thing? Yeah, it was like a Freddy Krueger parody on a cartoon yeah. or something. Scary and Terry? Had, huh? Scary Terry, he had miniature swords for knives well, no, on Rick, Rick, Rick and Morty. Yeah, I, I know that, but like even older than that, like way back, like in like the 90s or early 2000s, it was like, it was like sporks. Like he, he threw out his hand and he had sporks. It was like... Uh, even before SpongeBob, I think. I don't know. Anyways, when you said that, I, I saw it in my head for a second. But uh, maybe like The Simpsons or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah. Um, where were, what were we saying? <laughs> oh, I got a sports now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after that. Sports everywhere. <laughs> Laura finds out that her litter, litter, blah, 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 little oh. sister oh. Shelby. That's a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. Um She's been all prim and proper and never wants to go out. And you find out that her little sister is dating the steroid jock asshole lifeguard Chester, which I don't even want to picture that. Um, and they're hanging out in a pool and then someone kills Chester and Shelby just disappears, which I'm just like, what are you doing disappearing the scene of a crime and is now in a convenient coma? I suspected her before that, by the way, like right before that, and I think that was it. Um, but we it, it, it left us to believe, huh? Keep keeping secrets. That that's a indication. <laughs> so yeah, Shelby, Shelby, that's that's who it is. That's who it is. Shelby. Yeah, I wanted. I was I was hoping it took a while because aside from the that moment when she was sick which is supposed to be your clue that <clears throat> i didn't think you would do that the same as you did the librarian so you got me there you know ah, you got yeah, that that actually got me and i wanted her to be sort of this you know this sort of stereotypical cutesy little sister type and then and then you're so distracted by finding out that she's not and that she's dating chester that that's supposed to throw you off for a few minutes on finding out that it's actually her because you're still kind of going, what? Yeah, that was... What? How old is she? <laughs> See, I just pictured she was like a year younger. That's what I had to keep telling myself. Yeah, it was... Uh... She's, 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 a, she's, just, she's a little sister in age, you know, not like a... I'm like a little sister, <laughs> just a little sister. No, she's not eight, that's for sure. She well, is just like within a few few years younger, but it should be still very jarring. It's it is, yeah. Well, let's see what happens to big buff guys who thinks they think they can pick up little sisters and stuff. So I think it's time for that uh, last clip. The one with Buck. Oh no, we're not doing that clip. Uh, you can either edit this out or keep it in. I don't care. We'll keep uh, it in. I, let's talk. Let's let's talk about that part though. Okay. I wrote Buff and Buck next to each other because Buff goes to Chester and Buck goes to Psycho. So I think that's where I got those confused. Oh, Never hey, mind. Y'all don't get to hear uh, Chester drowning. So yeah, you, unless, unless you listen to the book, you won't hear it in this episode. Yeah, you, um, you can listen to the link in the description below. It's pretty cool. But let's talk about his death. <laughs> Go ahead. You can drown mystery. like a pump. He gets drowned like a punk. Yes, he does. <laughs> and I love how everything gets blamed on on the bum. Oh, yeah. They're, oh, I completely forgot about the bum. Yeah, right. He gets killed in the car accident, and suddenly his blood's at murder scenes, which is like... I think Didn't they do that in a couple of the Saw movies? They were, like, using a guy's hand, a severed yep. hand, to, like, make fingerprints at the scene. Like, and they're just Shelby like, Freddy yeah. is taking this bum around. And, <laughs> and you see, that's what I loved about this book. We you actually didn't believe a, bum evidence. This is one of, you know, like like you did in Virtual Terror with the mall dream. We got a dream after the wreck had happened, you know, where she where Laura dreamed about the wreck and it was Freddy behind the wheel, you know. So I thought that was really freaking cool because uh, that, that took me back to Virtual Terror. And uh, that, mall, that mall dream was something I really enjoyed about that book. Um, but, yeah, the bum. 
because that's who they think killed the girl at the mall and everything, you know? Yeah, and, well, uh, you know you know his identity, right? It's Red Herring. Oh, yeah, it's Red Herring from, uh, <laughs> Red yeah. <laughs> from the kids' Scooby-Doo show, yeah. Yeah. It's Red Herring. Um, but yeah, I liked the bum. I liked how it was all, you know, getting pinned on him. Uh, obviously, we knew, you know, we kind of guessed he wasn't the one actually doing it. Mm-hmm. Although that would have been a twist. That would have been a twist because we wouldn't have been expecting it. But uh, I think and Shelby gets, is great. Oh yeah, he just gets left at the last scene and they're like, why aren't they keeping up this ruse? It was like, the body's too rotten. Like, no one's <laughs> going to believe this clearly died six years ago guy is leaving all this blood and evidence and vis- various fluids. Even Freddy's got a breaking point. You know, when when they st- when they start leaking that much, he's done with them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that sets everything up because then, you know, the the reader is informed it's not who they thought it was, and it leads up to this to the clip you did want to play. Yeah. And uh, this is a pretty cool one. This is the one that you and you and David both picked, didn't it? Yeah. So Buck ends up being completely psychotic, and he tries to lure. Lure, Laura, lure, lure, lure. What is with these tongue twisters tonight? Um, so he tries to lure, lure tries to get her to the hospital. All right, uh, by saying I'm gonna mess with your little sister, and she's like, "You better not." So you know, calls and goes to the hospital, and Buck has something planned for the hospital room, which we're about to see unfolding in the climax. So roll it. What's a game without a cheat? Buck asked himself as he climbed a back stairway at the hospital. He had called from a payphone just outside. Laura could never reach the hospital in time. In time for what? Now there was the $64,000 question. That's for me to know and Laura to find out. Buck chuckled to himself as he exited the stairwell. Shelby's room was just down the hall. Ah, the things he had done to ensure Laura would be his. The conspiracy, the crimes. Yes, the crimes. Buck checked the hallway. It was empty. He continued toward Shelby's room. He had done so much, but Laura had still rejected him. And she wasn't just playing hard to get any longer. She was playing never to get. He put his hand on the doorknob of Shelby's room. As he looked to the left and right, the hallway appeared to be empty. Buck slipped silently into Shelby's room. Shelby lay there in a pained sleep. Now it was time to wait for Laura to arrive. In the meantime, there was one last thing to do. Buck smiled grimly and withdrew the straight razor from his pocket. Chapter 14 Laura and Doug burst through the emergency room doors. You get security, Laura ordered. I'll go up to Shelby's room. You shouldn't go up there alone, Doug insisted. I have to. Maybe it's the only thing that'll keep Buck from doing something crazy. If he hasn't already. They both knew this was a possibility, but Laura felt she had already wasted too much time to argue. Just do it. I'll be okay. With that, she ran off. Doug seemed almost frozen in place, torn between following her and calling security. Laura couldn't worry about that. She just had to hope his paralysis would end so he could do his part and get help. The elevator couldn't reach the third floor fast enough. Laura pounded on the open door button as soon as the three lit up on the panel above her. At the first movement of the door, she immediately tried to force them open faster. The doors themselves seemed to resist her as if on Buck's orders. Come on! She yelled and squeezed out the opening as soon as there was room. 
The hallway seemed dimmer than it should be, and Laura realized that someone had turned off most of the overhead lights. It made the going slow, but she finally reached Shelby's room. Inside it was even darker. Buck? She called tentatively from the doorway. There was no answer. She reached for the light switch on the wall. Fluorescent bulbs buzzed to life, and Laura shrank against the doorframe in horror. Covering Shelby's bed was a swarm of plastic tubing. The liquid in it now, though, was red. Blood was backing up into them. Shelby's blood. Laura forced herself to move toward the bed. So thick was the tangle of tubing, she could not even see her sister's face. On the wall behind the bed in dripping red letters were the words, Help! Wanted. Tears welled in Laura's eyes. She glanced at the other end of the bed. Something was wrong. It was the size of the feet. Somebody had neglected to remove Shelby's shoes. Pulling the sheet off, Laura discovered black tennis shoes. She recognized them instantly. As quickly as she could, she cleared away some of the tubing obscuring the patient's face. On his face was etched terror greater than any Laura had ever seen before. Buck lay in the hospital bed, dead. The unearthly laughter began then. It didn't come from any particular place in the room, but surrounded her. It was a harsh, cruel rasp, and it threatened to close in and crush Laura. The sound of a dead bolt sliding into place came through the laughter. That sound, Laura could pinpoint, and she spun toward the door. There stood Shelby in her bloody hospital gown. Twin streams of thick red liquid gushed from her nose. As she pulled her hand away from the lock, Shelby was laughing. Somehow that sourceless sound was emanating from her. Her eyes were bloodshot, cold, evil. Not Shelby's at all. So, are you going to apply for any of these jobs, or what? Shelby's voice croaked. It was like listening to two voices at once. Shelby's doubled by that of some ancient evil thing a millisecond behind. The sound was disorienting. What are you talking about? Laura's voice was quivering with terror. What, what do you think? think? Answered the double-voiced monster that had been her sister. You, you wanted a job so badly. I gave you four wonderful opportunities. The thing started walking toward Laura. Although, I know you weren't keen on working at the hospital. Things are a little <laughs> dead around here. It gestured to Buck and laughed again. Laura wanted to retch, scream, and fall to the floor clutching her ears at the same time. Somehow she remained on her feet and back toward the curtain that divided the room in half. And we're back. So what did you come up with? I just realized that this, my favorite, favorite thing about this is is the very ending of, of how how she dispatches Freddy. Yeah. I was expecting everyone to die. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like this better. Yeah, because I, I, I really didn't want, you know, Shelby to die. You know, and, you know, like, uh, out of all the ones, all the people that got possessed, you know, she was like maybe the most sympathetic, um, because it was her sister. I don't know. Um, I also but, yeah. didn't want to see Laura get blamed for everything. They arrest Laura and she's like, I just wanted a job. Now everyone's <laughs> dead. My little sister's barbecued and I just want to go home. Oh my God. What about, uh, like that, that Freddie book, uh, dream spawn. Yeah, now at the end, that girl gets blamed for like the mass murder at the school. You know, dozens of people dead. And no, it was, it was, just, it was like it was like hundreds of people dead. Technology she never could have had, and they're like, "Oh yeah, th this weird woman did. She's the only survivor. That must mean she killed everybody." Oh god, that's what but that guy. That's got to be what that means. It was still written very well, though. The characters were written very well. I just think she had trouble. Krista Faust had trouble with the ending. She's an amazing author. I uh, agree. The, the ending fell kind of flat. Anyways, I just it, you said what you said about Laura, and it reminded me of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's talk about this final showdown and how Freddy's dispatched. I liked it a lot. Um, it, it was kind of like 
coming in and out of reality. Like you didn't know if the little sister was going to be killed in the process because she was being held by Freddie. And I think at a certain point, even Laura didn't know that. She was just like, well, here are my options. Live with a possessed sister or kill her. <laughs> and I think Clear. if there's only two options, like, well, I'm going to pick the other one. Mm-hmm. I even got the sound effects for the for the paddles, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, scene. Yeah. Uh, that was pretty cool. You Did know, we get, just watch uh, a movie where someone got killed with those? Oh, it was um, Dr. Giggles. Yes, and uh, we did a... Uh, we did a slash, slash tracks, tracks on, that. on that. Yeah. Did you watch the slash tracks on that? Um, I watched bits and pieces because I, I wanted to go back and actually watch the movie. Okay. Yeah. Um, before no, you watch it, tear it apart. <laughs> uh, Dexter did that one time on the TV show Dexter. He killed two people, two paramedics that were killing people. He got them each with a paddle. I, um, I seem to think that that somebody killed somebody like this in the series Mod Squad in the seventies. With with paddles, but I know there was one where they tried to kill him with their with their their IV drip. But the this this was this was me. This ending was me sort of coming back out of my funk and think and trying to think of something cool. And I had this this and I actually came up with that first and worked backward into why they were in the hospital in the first place. Oh, because no. it's, one, I want I had this challenge of not wanting to kill the sister. So how do I do that? Especially since everybody else dies in in the other books when they when Freddie's been in them. I'm like, okay, so how do I do that? And then the other was just the image. Like I imagine if this were a movie, how cool that would look for every time you did that, you know, this girl, like this sh- electric shell of Freddy would yes. just tear over her and then crackle away. And then, and, and that's when I, that's like probably the first time I got truly, truly excited in the first draft of the book when I thought, Oh, I got this really cool idea, this image, this is going to be really cool. And then I bet. And so I, I then went backwards and reverse engineered it. it. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think cool. I even mentioned in my like discussion at the end of that, how that would be awesome in a Freddy movie. You know, the whole zap Freddy, you know, that was really cool. Like, uh, very good visuals there. Well, Wes Craven, did Wes Craven do Shocker? Yes. Okay, I had vibes like that, and it's funny because he did Nightmare on Elm Street as well, so I definitely got Wes Craven vibes toward the end of this uh, book. Awesome. See, David, David's got a full connection right there, man. <laughs> he's got it. He, he's got the secret ingredient. He's got the craven ingredient. Um, the, the craven ingredient. <laughs> I like it. Although saying I've got the craven yeah. sounds, sounds like a really messed up disease. Or um, you're hungry. Or yeah, yeah. you're a coward. Well, I always thought uh, Elvis Presley's song, Burning Love, sounded like a really messed up STD. <laughs> Could have been a metaphor for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read it in a, in a pink book, so mm-hmm. you know, full circle. Uh, you talked about something. This has nothing to do with the book or the show, but I got to mention this because you talked about a second ago on a on that show. Uh, somebody tried to kill somebody with their IV drip. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I might even put this clip here just for the fun of it. Uh, one of the most there's there's an earnest movie. Called, one of the last ones he did called Ernest in the Army. And there's a scene that's supposed to be funny, but it's just terrifying and and evil in a way. Uh, Ernest, uh, his friend has a heart attack, and his friend is in the hospital bed, and Ernest is talking, gee, I'm sorry, Burn, or whatever, you know, I'm sorry. And he turns to leave, and he pulls the guy's IV out. Ooh. Ernest then goes to start trying to jab the IV back in the guy. Oh. He's like licking the licking the needle and like uh, stuck here uh, and stuck in there. And it's supposed to be funny, and the guy's like, mm, mm, you know, I'm like, he's like killing the guy. This isn't Ernest. Stop it. Uh, He's calling nurse. You know, this isn't slapstick. Uh, I'm gonna show it. It's pretty. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty sick. Wow, that sounds horrible. It is horrible, and it's supposed to be comedy. After this episode's over, it's going to be at the end. Uh, check it out whenever it, whenever it goes live. It's it's supposed to be comedy, and as a kid, I was horrified. 
I was like, why is Ernest trying to kill his friend? <laughs> I guess I guess uh, Vern didn't know. Mm. He didn't know what he meant. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk about casting. Ah. Freddy Krueger, Robert England. that was easy. Uh, <laughs> I don't think uh, there's any book I've read where it would be the other guy. Um, what do you think, Chester? Let's talk Chester, the big buff guy. Jim Padalecki from Supernatural, Sam Winchester. Young, uh, young, younger Jared Padalecki. He's too lanky. For the me. dude from Shark. The dude he from got Shark pretty Bowl. muscled up in like season four, though. He got pretty muscled he, up. He's yeah. I I think I think of more like more like you know dad bod Zach Efron. Okay. What do you think, Sean? The shark pool dude, man. Oh yeah, you said that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cool dude, right. All right, let's talk Buck. You know, okay, this might be completely off, but I was thinking Jack Nicholson really, really, really young. Like, maybe a younger Jack Nicholson that we've seen on screen. I think he can do the the charming, but then go completely fucking psycho. Like, like a lot of what we saw in oh, The Shining. Yeah. But isn't uh, that, that other actor who, when he was young, was a lot like a young... Uh, from Heather's. Oh, uh, Christian Slater. Christian Slater. See, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, he would have done a fantastic job. See, now that you said that, I think you would, but I was thinking like teenage Leonardo DiCaprio for Buck. Um, so I feel stupid now. Ooh. Or Heath Ledger yeah. um, as a teenager. But uh, yeah, Christian Slater, definitely. And then Doug, you know, the the BFF that's in love with her. Um, Adam, what's his name oh. from the OC? Um, oh, he was in Shazam. He was. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm talking? Yeah, I exactly. Like, no, Zachary I see the face. Hmm. You mean Zachary Levi? No, not Zachary Levi. Oh. The the he he this guy the actor he's been in a bunch of stuff. But he shows up as one of the brothers when they Shazam as a family. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I was, I was uh, thinking just. Go ahead. I was thinking Justin Long for uh, Doug. Oh, that would be good. He has that kind of like best friend kind of vibe going on. Like he might not be the main character or the the super buff love interest guy. See, yep. I was thinking teenage Jack Black, like from Mars Attacks or before, mm. you know, but uh, that was just me. Oh, I forgot he was in Mars Attacks. Yeah, he played the, he was the son of the, you, you know, the old Walking Tall movie? Yeah, the, the original first one. Yeah. I can't think of the guy, because like a different guy, uh, Svensson took over in like in like the second, third and fourth one. But the guy that was in the first one, I can't think of his name. Yeah. He was he played Jack's black Jack Black's dad in Mars Attack. They were the they lived in a trailer and he was and his son got in the military. Uh anyways, yeah, that's who I was picturing. But uh yeah, as far as Laura and Shelby, I don't know. I really don't know. Sh Shelby Gosh. See, Laura's tough because Laura is based on a specific friend of mine. Named Laura. <laughs> okay. And she looks exactly like her in my brain. Uh, Shelby is like, God, what's just, there's there's a bunch of like little sister. Ooh, Maggie's little sister on The Walking Dead. The blonde. Yeah, she's blonde. For some reason, the little Shelby is blonde. To That's death. what I pictured too, unless it, the book actually said that. It might have actually said that, but yeah. yeah. I was but, picturing yeah. like uh, the the babysitter massacre, the uh, the older sister and the younger sister that hang out, that go up against the drill guy. Okay, kind of like his Laura and Shelby. Yeah, that's because cool. they, they, they had they had like a the, a bond relationship. They weren't they didn't exactly fit the characters, but the the bond they had, I, I see with these two. Well, let's uh, let's rate it, Sean. Uh, yeah, I give it five out of five. I was very entertained throughout this. I think everyone needs to take a fucking chill pill, but it was very <laughs> entertaining and had a great ending. Uh, you never knew what was coming. It was a lot of characters you love to hate and you love to see them die. Um, but it is what it is.
I'm going to give it a 4.9999999, okay? And I'm going to explain. Okay? I'm going to explain. You're going to see it coming. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was great. I thought it kept you guessing. I thought the characters were great. I had a lot of fun getting to uh, get into these characters' heads mm -hmm. and play them. Uh, I thought Freddy was handled great. The dream, uh, you know, at the beginning with the bum and it's Freddy and then the bum being used uh, after the murders to throw people off all great stuff really amazing when the whole shocking and it goes from Shelby to Freddie shock Freddie but the thing is man this book was pink I thought it was a romance book really <laughs> you're gonna join the critics here <laughs> no nah, I give it a five it was great <laughs> all the way all the way around well you can still give it a four point nine 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 you're just rounding up Okay, okay, there we go. Just if, if it's not romance, man, it, don't make it pink. I mean, come on. Yeah, because <laughs> you're gonna have to get me a screenshot of that. Just I just I want a screenshot. Every, every bit of control over that. <laughs> I know. I'm just it's it's all good, man. No, I know. Um, thank you so much for talking about these books with us. Thank you. Uh, I can't believe this is the last one. Um, we'll, talk, we'll just have to talk about them again, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I do. We are gonna. We are gonna talk about your work on the Bone Chillers, though. So we'd like to have you back for that. Fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm gonna do a little double feature of those at Halloween. That's the plan. Oh, so. nice. Excellent. And what's the names of them? For uh, one of those first one is um, uh, Night of the Living Clay, and then the second one is. Uh, uh, my favorite title of any of my titles, A Terminal Case of the Uglies. There we go. <laughs> it's going to be a double feature. It's going to be this year's Halloween uh, narration. So I'm looking forward to that. And then we're going to come back on here and talk about them. So, uh, yeah. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. And uh, we'll see you on After the Slash if you're a patron. If not, sign up. It's only like two bucks a month. And it's a lot of fun. This is Sean Campbell saying, if this one doesn't scare you, you're already dead. Or maybe you just feel like you do. Maybe you need some water or some pills. I don't know. I got a headache. <laughs> uh, this is Dave Bergantino. I need help coming up with a, a, a tagline. So I'm looking, looking, I'm going to be looking at the comments for this for, for a tagline. Maybe, maybe somebody can help me with that. Maybe there's like a job back there, you know, one of them listings behind you, you know. Right. Need a tagline? Need a tagline. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. We'll see you next time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. And if I ever lost you, I... <laughs> Well, I gotta go now, Ben. And I'll say a little prayer for you, okay? You, you hang in there, No. This thing came out. I'll put it back in for you. Oh, stay. Stay in there now. Get some rest.